الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته welcome brothers and sisters to lesson 30 I'm sorry I'm sorry welcome brothers and sisters to the program 30 lessons from the life of the last prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم welcome to lesson 27 the conquest of mecca part 2 lesson 27 the conquest of mecca part 2 um, the prophet at this point sallallahu alaihi wasallam has set out for mecca and at this and he is leading an army of about 10,000 his followers and they departed from mecca on the 10th of ramadan in the year 8th of al hijrah or the 8th year of al hijrah and the Prophet and his companions, obviously because it was Ramadan, they were fasting when they departed al Medina. But when they reached al Kadid, which was a water hole between um, Usfan and Qudayd, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they reached that point, broke his fast and his companions broke their fasts as well. Now, as the Muslims continued to approach Mecca, and they, draw, they, they were drawing closer and closer, and obviously the word had reached um, Abu Sufyan and the Meccans, Abu Sufyan decided to come out, come out of the city and meet the Prophet ﷺ as he was approaching the city. And he sought permission to meet with the Prophet ﷺ. Again, I, I assume uh, that the, uh, Abu Sufyan wanted to ward off um, what he perceived would be a lot of bloodshed. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed to meet Abu Sufyan. And when he met him, before Abu Sufyan could say anything, the Prophet addressed Abu Sufyan and he said, Wayhak ya Abu Sufyan. He said, Woe unto you, Abu Sufyan. What is wrong with you, Abu Sufyan? Alam ya'ni laka an ta'lam annahu la ilaha illallah. Has not the time come for you to acknowledge that I am the messenger? I'm sorry. Has not the time come for you to acknowledge that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah? To this, Abu Sufyan, he replied, he said, May my father and mother be sacrificed for your sake. Your mild temperament, your kindness, your commitment to connecting the ties of kinship, all of these things are undeniable. And if there were a God besides Allah, he would have helped me by now. It is clear to me that God is on your side, not on our side, because he continues to help you and he is not helping us. So pay attention, brothers and sisters. At this point, Abu Sufyan is acknowledging that there's no deity worthy of worship to Allah and that their idols that they worship are not really God and they're not really of any benefit. And the true God is Allah. So you would think to yourself, okay, what's the problem? So the Prophet goes on, he says, he responds to that and says, Way hak ya Abu Sufyan. He said, What's wrong with you, Abu Sufyan? Woe unto you. Alam ya'ni laka an ta'lam anni Rasulullah. He said, Has not the time come for you to acknowledge that I am the messenger of Allah? And to this, Abu Sufyan, he replied, He said, May my, mother, my, may my father and mother be sacrificed for your sake, your mild temperament, your kindness, your commitment. Connecting the ties of kinship, all of these things are undeniable. But this issue is something that even after everything, I am unable to admit. So now pay attention, brothers and sisters. He's ready to admit that Allah is the only God, but can't bring himself to say that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Why? Because of the pride of Jahiliyyah and the fact that Abu Sufyan, although he's from Quraysh, he's not from Bani Hashim. He is from a rival clan from the clans of the tribe of Quraysh. And they have this, you know, this sibling rivalry, this, this, this uh, rivalry of trying to be the best, the superior clan of the clans of Quraysh. And if he acknowledges that the messenger, that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah, then he is conceding the superiority of Bani Hashim, their clan over his clan. And so that pride, that desire to not admit that the Prophet is superior, his clan is superior, not to give them a leg up. If I say that, then I'm admitting that you are better than me and your clan is better than my clan. I'm not prepared to do that. So he said, I just can't bring myself to say that. Whereupon Al-Abbas, 
the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, he chimed in and he said, What is wrong with you, Abu Sufyan? Become a Muslim and testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Do this before he strikes your neck with his sword. So Al Abbas was very forceful and telling him, Look, it's, this is not the time to let your pride get between you and doing the right thing. Because if you don't humble yourself and accept his prophethood and messengership, then you're going to have to humble yourself by being cut down. And when, that, when, when, when Abu Sufyan heard that, he embraced Islam and declared the testimony of truth. Army then proceeded. And they entered Mecca on Tuesday, the 17th of Ramadan. And they did so with very little resistance. There was very little resistance to their entering the, uh, the, uh, the city. And once the Prophet entered the city, he proceeded immediately to the sanctuary, to the Grand Mosque in Mecca. And obviously at that point, the Kaaba was surrounded by about 360 idols that the pagans of Arabia worshipped. So the Prophet, when he entered the sanctuary, he knocked each one of these idols down one by one with his bow. He went to each idol and knocked it down with his bow. And as he knocked each idol down, he recited the verse from the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقِّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say, truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Surely falsehood is ever bound to be vanquished. Then the Prophet called for the key holder, Uthman ibn Talha, took the key from him and opened the Kaaba and went inside. He broke the idols that were inside the Kaaba with his own blessed hands and ordered that the images painted on the walls of the Kaaba be erased. Once the Kaaba of all of the symbols of a shirk, the Prophet offered prayers therein, thanking Allah who out of his immense grace had granted him victory. The Prophet then came out of the Kaaba after offering these prayers and address the people who had gathered now in the sanctuary. They want to see what's going to happen. What is the Prophet going to do now? So he addressed the people and he began, he began his address with the same words in which he had began his first mission and address to the people in Mecca when he first over 20 years before. He said, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. He said, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah who has no associates or rivals. This was my message then, this is my message now, at the time of the conquest. Then he said, every claim of privilege, whether blood or property, is now under my heel. All of these vendettas, all of these, um, these scores that people want to settle, all of that is under my heel. Then he said, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, Inna allaha qad adhaba ankum nakhwat al-jahiliyya, وَتَعَظُّمَهَا بِالْآبَاءَ النَّاسُ مِنْ آدَمْ وَالْآدَمْ وَآدَمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ O oh, people of Quraysh, surely Allah has abolished from you all of the pride of the pre-Islamic period of ignorance and all of the pride in your ancestry. All men are descendants of Adam and Adam was made from dirt. Then he followed this by reciting the ayah from the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ O mankind, we have certainly created you from a single male and a single female and made you nations and tribes from that single male and single female that you may know one another. Indeed, the most honorable of you in the sight of Allah is the most God-fearing. Verily, Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Then after making this beautiful address in which he tried to begin correcting the mindset of the people he had just conquered, their mindset with, their mindset with respect to Allah, that he has many partners, and also their mindset with respect to other people beyond themselves, thinking that they are superior by virtue of their lineage or their Arab ethnicity, the Prophet wanted to correct that mindset. After doing all that, making this beautiful address, trying to correct these two things, the Prophet then said, 
he completed his address by saying, Ya ma'ashar Quraysh, ma tarona anni fa'inum bikum. Oh, people of Quraysh, what do you think I'm going to do to you? After all that you have done to me and to my people. You cursed me, you criticized me, you called me names, you expelled me. You persecuted my followers, you made them have to flee and migrate from their home. And you killed some of them and some of them you executed publicly. After all of these things that you have done, you fought me and killed my followers on the battlefield. Mutilated their bodies after all of these things that you've done to me. What do you think I'm going to do to you? They said, Khairan. We expect nothing but goodness from you. Akhun Kareem wa Akhin Kareem. O noble brother, O son of a noble brother. Whereupon the Prophet said, and he didn't disappoint them, he said, Idhabu fa'antum attulaqa. Go, for you are emancipated. You are free to go. Then after that, when the time for prayer came, the Prophet Sallallahu he instructed Bilal to climb on top of the Kaaba and pronounce the call to prayer. One of the pagans, Attab ibn Usaid, said to his companion, Al-Hadith ibn Hisham, Allah has certainly honored Usaid, meaning his father, by not having heard this and therefore hearing what would anger him. Al-Hadith replied, By Allah, if I thought it was the truth, I would have followed it. I would have accepted it. So both of them, even after everything that has happened, are still being what? Arrogant and obstinate upon their disbelief and saying bad things about the Prophet's religion and his companions and the call to prayer. The Prophet, who was not anywhere near them at the time when they had this conversation, he came over to them. And he told them exactly what they had said and what had transpired in their conversation. And when they heard the Prophet tell them, knowing that the Prophet had no way of knowing what they had said except through revelation, it was only then that they had, they felt they had no choice but to embrace truth and accept Islam. Lessons. What should we learn? What can we learn from what we heard today? First of all, the fasting traveler is given the concession to break his fast, especially if fasting while traveling presents a hardship for him or her, and he or she should feel no guilt in doing so. Allah says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَإِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So if there's anyone amongst you during the month of Ramadan who is ill or traveling, then that person may break their fast and make up those missed days from other days. Number two from the lessons. The Prophet's aim was singular. To invite people to embrace Islam and to give them every chance to accept it. He did not actively seek to spill blood or to gain riches. The Prophet ﷺ, it's clear from this part of the story and throughout the, his life that the Prophet only wanted people to accept Islam. He didn't want to kill them. He didn't want to take their money or their wealth. And so the things that we hear about our Prophet from non-Muslims, that he was a bloodthirsty warlord who preyed on weaker tribes. He, he preyed on them. He plundered them, he took their wealth and took their belongings and if they didn't accept Islam, he took their lives. Those things are false because we have example after example after example where the Prophet sought nothing but the people's acceptance of Islam and he offered them every opportunity to spare their lives, to spare their wealth and just to accept Islam. He offered them every opportunity and the clear example uh, here is Abu Sufyan and also the people of Mecca when he conquered them he let them go free he didn't take their wealth he didn't enslave them he didn't just kill them طيب, number three from the lessons pride is perhaps the greatest obstacle to accepting the truth and we see this clearly from the conversation of the dialogue between Abu Sufyan and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the interjection Prophet al Abbas that when Abu Sufyan was confronted by the Prophet and he asked him, isn't it time for you to accept that there's no deity worthy of worship to Allah? That there's no God but God? 
Abu Sufyan said, yeah, it's clear to me. At this point, it's clear to me that these, uh, these other idols, these gods that we worship, are not really God because they haven't helped us. And God, the true Allah, continues to help you. So it's clear to me that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. So then he said, well, aren't you prepared to admit that I'm the messenger of Allah? He said, oh, I can't do that. Because you're from Bani Hashim. I can't do that. And then Al-Abbas interjected. He said, what's wrong with you? Testify or he is going to cut your neck. If you don't humble yourself by testifying that he, his clan is better and he as an individual is better than you. If you don't humble yourself now, you're going to be humbled by having your neck struck. And he did what? He accepted. What prevented him from accepting? Nothing changed. Al-Abbas didn't give him some undeniable proof that the Prophet was the Messenger of Allah. He only gave him what? He gave him two options, to be humbled in this world or humbled in the hereafter. He gave him two options. That clearly shows that what was preventing Abu Sufyan was not the knowledge that the Prophet was the Messenger of Allah, but it was the pride that was within himself. That's what was holding him back. Number four from the lessons. The Prophet ﷺ possessed remarkable qualities, endearing qualities that even his enemies couldn't deny. Abu Sufyan, when the Prophet said, don't you see on the Messenger of Allah, don't you see that there's la ilaha in Allah, he said, oh, your mild temperament, your kindness, your commitment to connect. He just went on and on, waxing poetic about the Prophet's qualities, the endearing qualities. There's no, I can't deny that you are a good person, you are a good man. You Number five, is that firmness has its place in da'wah. Firmness has its place in da'wah. We call people and invite people to Allah. The original rule is that we invite them with kindness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنٍ He says, and do not debate the people of the book except in the best manner, using kind words and moderate preaching. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا Except those who transgress. Indicating that there's some people who because of their transgression, because of their behavior, nothing will benefit them except what? Except some harshness. And we also see this in the story. When Al-Abbas told Abu Sufyan, Wayhak, what's wrong with you except Islam before he strikes your neck? Al-Abbas was very what? Harsh. He was very stern. He was very forceful in his speech. And the Prophet didn't what? The Prophet didn't disapprove. The Prophet tacitly approved of what Al-Abbas did and it worked. Abu Sufyan, it's almost like he needed to hear it in that way. He accepted it. And this is important because many people will tell us, or they will say, that harshness has no place in da'wah. We always have to be kind, we always have to be nice, and we can never be harsh, and we can never say things in a very, uh, a very um, pointed way. But we see from the story that that's not the case. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he likened it, what he likened it to, he likened it to dirty hands. Imagine a person's hands working on a car. And he's got all kind of like carbon fibers and different things just embedded into his hands. And he goes to wash them with just some water and he's rubbing very lightly. The hands won't come clean. In order for him to get those clean, there's gonna have to, he's going to have to be a little what? There's going to have to be some abrasiveness, some abrasion. And that abrasiveness will do what? It will clean the hands to the point that afterwards... We look at the hands and we appreciate the abrasiveness because how clean the hands have become as a result of it. And this is what Ibn Taymiyyah likens to what? To the harshness that sometimes has to be applied in da'wah. That there's some people who won't hear you unless you speak to them in a very, a very you know, rigid manner. That's not the way that we ordinarily want to be. But sometimes we have to be that way because that's what's going to benefit the person and make them accept Islam, accept the truth. Some people have to hear it that way. And at the end of the day, we're worried about what? The result, accepting the truth. Not necessarily how we get there in this case. That we'd love to get there by being nice. But if we have to get there by, being, by not being nice, it's worth it if we get there, if the person gets the guidance. But I have number six from the lessons is that Tawheed is only completed when the eradication of idolatry and the association of partners with Allah and all of the symbols of idolatry are what? Are eradicated. And you see this from the Prophet ﷺ, that he came and immediately started what? Knocking down those idols with his bow, went inside, to the, went inside the Kaaba, broke those idols and ordered that the pictures on the walls be what? Be erased. It's not enough 
for us to say La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is part of it. The other part of it is what? Getting rid of what? What is worship min dunillah? What is worship besides Allah? Which is why all of the prophets, as Allah says, were sent with this with this two part job or responsibility. Allah says, We have appointed in every community a messenger who proclaimed worship Allah alone and shun the false deities. Not just worship Allah alone, but get rid of the false gods. Why Muslims, we're not supposed to have 3D, three-dimensional images, figurines and small idols in our homes. We don't do that. Because why? These are symbols of a shirk. We also don't have pictures and photographs all over the wall. Why? Because these are symbols of a shirk. We don't do that. And the Prophet ﷺ used to tell his companions, لا تدع سورة إلا طمستها Do not leave a graven image or a picture except that you what? You wipe it out. You get rid of it. Because why? These are the symbols of shirk and we are the people of Tawheed. And Tawheed is not just believing in Allah alone, but it's also disbelieving and eradicating a shirk. Number seven from the lessons, Islam is against any form of prejudice and discrimination, racism, colorism, ethnic prejudice, caste systems, etc. And we see this when the Prophet addressed the people, when he came out of the Kaaba and addressed the people, he said, Ya ma'ashar Quraysh, inna Allah qad adhhab ankum nakhwat al jahiliya wa ta'adumaha bil abah, an nasu min adam wa adam min turab. He told them Allah has gotten rid of this, has eradicated from you. This pride in your ancestry and in your fathers and, and in your and in your in your ethnicities, etc. Anasum and Adam. All of the people are descendants of Adam, and Adam was from dirt. Number eight from the lessons: the mercy of the Prophet, which encompassed his enemies and a, a level of mercy which his followers, you, I, and every Muslim is supposed to try to emulate. We're supposed to be trying to be as merciful as as the Prophet was, after all of the things that the people had done to him, the Meccans had done to him, the Prophet said, Idhabu fa'antum tulaqa. You're free to go. It's fine. I'm going to let bygones be bygones. Another lesson, number nine, how the Prophet intentionally placed underserved and disenfranchised members of his ummah in prominent positions to boost their self-esteem, to boost their confidence, and to undo certain stereotypes and combat prejudices. The Prophet ﷺ puts Bilal the first call of prayer in Mecca after the conquest, he insisted it had to be Bilal. And not just Bilal on the ground. No, Bilal go on top of the Kaaba and recite, proclaim the call to prayer so everybody can see that you, because of your Iman, you have status in, in, despite your black skin. And we talked about this early on in the beginning of the Sirah. We talked about how the people at the time of the Prophet had a problem with people with handicaps whether they had actual physical handicaps or social handicaps, like their gender, like their race, like their ethnicity, like their tribe, etc. The Prophet wanted to combat that. He was sent to combat that. That's why he was an orphan, because being an orphan was also a social handicap that caused people to mistreat you and look down upon you. So the Prophet came to combat that. And so the first thing that he did was what? To elevate Bilal, radiallahu anhu. Last but not least from lesson, lesson number 10, is even the most insolent, stubborn, and arrogant of individuals is not a lost cause. Sometimes there are people who you just feel like when you talk to them, when you interact with them, because they are so stubborn, because they are so hard-headed, because they are so, um, you know, they refuse to listen, and they're so stuck in their ways that this person will never believe. And we have the example in the story of Atab, and his companion, Al-Hadith. And right there, after everything had happened, the Prophet had conquered them and humbled them and humiliated them. Even then, they were still arrogant and speaking bad about his religion, the call to prayer, etc. And it was only when the Prophet came over to them and related to them what, he, what they had said via revelation. He wasn't in their vicinity. It was only then that they accepted Islam, but they did accept Islam, even though they were so stubborn and insolent, even at the last moment. What that teaches us is that we should never say that it's no use. This person will never believe. We never say that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can open the heart of even the hardest hearted, most insolent and stubborn of people. It's never a lost cause. We give da'wah and we leave the rest to Allah. 
And with that, we conclude today's uh, lesson. And inshallah ta'ala, we look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow for lesson 28. But until then, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your families, to bless your children. To bless the rest of your evening, to bless your iftar, and to bless the good deeds that you will be doing this evening and in the coming evenings to try to catch Laylatul Qadr, the night that if we stand it in prayer and other forms of worship, Allah will forgive all of our previous sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who He teaches beneficial knowledge and who He benefits with the knowledge He teaches us by making us from those who practice it. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.